Okay, so today we are talking about stoichiometry. Big long word. By the way, at the end of class, um, if you have any questions from the enrichment that we did on Friday, I can take those. I haven't looked at your stuff from Friday yet. So if you have any questions about that, we can take that at the end of class today. But today we're talking about stoichiometry. Big scary word. Not really that scary in reality. Okay, so don't let the word freak you out. So stoichiometry really comes back to why bother doing all this moles business, right? Because last week we did all these calculations with moles, grams to moles, atoms to moles, etc. right? What's the point doing all that? Well, the point doing all that is so that we can do stoichiometry. That's why we do it. It's not just because I want to torture you, it's because we need to be able to do stoichiometry. Okay, so consider this reaction. Now, I'm not, not going to do it because it makes a giant mess, but here's pictures, okay? You got a gummy bear, you got a solution of potassium chlorate. Chlorate isn't one of the polyatomic ions you had to learn. It's ClO3 minus, so this would be KClO3. Take your gummy bear, chuck it in. What's gonna happen? Any predictions? Anyone wanna guess what happens? You make a big mess. Yeah, you just make a big giant mess. All right, so I'm not doing it as a demo because I don't wanna clean up all the mess. So there's some pictures. What information would you need if you wanted to replicate that reaction, let's pretend you do want to do it. You're like, hey, I want to see this in real life. I don't take your word for it that it's just a cool picture. I want to go try it myself. What information would you need if you wanted to do that experiment for yourself? You probably want to know the mass of the gummy bear, right? Or sucrose, you could just use sugar. What other information would you need to know? If you want to go in your home and do this. You'd probably want to know the mass of the potassium chlorate, right? How much potassium chlorate to use? Yes. You'd probably want to know the mass of the products so you can know how much cleaning up you have to do. I know that there's going to be a lot of cleaning up. That's why I don't do this as a demo because it makes a mess. I don't want to clean up. That's just the truth. Um, you might even want to know how much energy gets released, right? Because if this is something that's going to release on energy, we should probably protect ourselves in some way. Yes? Well, stoichiometry can answer all those questions. Stoichiometry allows us to predict how much we can get out of a reaction based on some initial amounts. Stoichiometry also allows us to work backwards. If I know how much product I want to make, I can calculate backwards how much reactant I need to use. Right? Let's pretend I'm doing a recipe and I want to make 12 dozen cookies. Okay, if I want to make 12 dozen cookies, I need to figure out how much sugar and flour and eggs and all that, right? So if you want to know a certain product, you can calculate backwards to figure out what reactant you should begin with. Vice versa, if you know you've got this much reactant, you can figure out how much product that's going to make. All right, so stoichiometry goes both ways. And I've got a nice little handout here for you. I'll give it to you in just a second. One of the things that's super important about stoichiometry is that your equation be balanced, okay? Your equations must be balanced before you can do any stoichiometry calculations, okay? Why? Because these coefficients here at the front, there's no coefficient there, so what do we assume the coefficient is? One. These coefficients tell us the mole ratios. Okay, what does that mean? That means that two moles of H2, are reacting with one mole of O2 to produce two moles of H2O, okay? Those coefficients are telling us the mole ratios. And this is an important step in stoichiometry, okay? So if your equation isn't balanced, your stoichiometry is gonna be a mess. So please, please, please double check your stoichiometry, and double check your mole ratios, make sure your equation's balanced before you start trying any stoichiometry. Because otherwise, there's a step of your stoichiometry that requires these mole ratios to be used. And if your equation is not balanced, that step of stoichiometry is going to be a mess. Okay, so stoichiometry has a bad reputation if you have friends who've taken chemistry, maybe in high school, maybe here at college. You know, people go, ah, oh, stoichiometry, that's the worst thing ever. But you have the amazing three step method. So, here are the steps in stoichiometry that I'm going to give you right now. I should copyright that. But I'm not going to, because that requires a so Here are the steps in stoichiometry. Obviously, write them down if you so choose. But I'm giving you this so that you don't have to. 
Obviously, you won't be able to use this handout on an exam. So eventually, you're going to need to commit, commit these steps to memory. But until you do, here are the steps. You follow these three steps in this order and set up all your conversion factors correctly, you will always get it correct 100% of the time. Now, what makes stoichiometry difficult and why people don't like it is because they can't balance equations. If you can't balance equations, you can't do stoichiometry. They can't write formulas. Can't write a formula, can't balance equations. They can't calculate molar mass, right? So if you've done lousy on all the previous stuff, well, it's, there's a good probability you're not going to like stoichiometry, right? However, if you did great on all the previous stuff, then this shouldn't be that big of a challenge for you, okay? Because all we're doing in stoichiometry is we're taking all that stuff that we've learned all the way up to this point in the semester, and we're using it all at once, okay? So the first thing we do in stoichiometry is we convert grams to moles of our starting material. Unless for some reason it's already given in moles, which it's not going to be. So how do we convert grams to moles? Do we use Avogadro's number? Or do we use molar mass? Molar mass, right. And how do we get molar mass? <clears throat> Pick a number out of the air and plop it on the page. How do we get molar mass? Mass number from the periodic table, right. So if it's H2O, right, you'd multiply two hydrogens, molar mass, which is 1.008, plus one oxygen, 15.999. There you go. Now we're going to multiply by the mole ratio from the balanced equation. So that'll convert us from moles of our starting material to moles of our finishing material. And then we'll convert moles of finishing material back to grams. Now this is what I say on the handout here as well. You can use this to find out information about products or reactants. Okay, so you can use stoichiometry to find out information about reactants or information about products. Okay, now just to, I want to throw this out too. Right? We're going to do all of the content today. We're going to do some practice problems here in class. And then on Wednesday, we'll do enrichment. Okay? So if after today you're feeling a little shaky, we're going to do enrichment on Wednesday that hopefully firms things up. And then on Friday, you're having a quiz on this. Okay? So just so you know, if you're looking at the syllabus, Friday, October, whatever Friday's date is, is listed as having a quiz. Okay? So just, just so you know. All right, so you convert grams to moles, mole ratio moles to grams. Three steps. So this is just a molecular level kind of real world problem. How much aspirin could be synthesized from 11.6 grams of salicylic acid? This is an experiment we do next semester if you take Chem 1124, which is elementary organic. No math in that class, by the way. That's my big selling point. Um, we actually synthesize aspirin. So if you ever have to take organic chem, elementary organic is a good class to get you ready for that. And this is an experiment we actually do. Okay, let's do this one together. The Haber process, that's actually a Nobel Prize winning reaction, in case you didn't know that, is used to produce ammonia, which is NH3, from hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas. How many grams of ammonia are produced when 16.8 grams of N2 reacts with excess H2, according to this equation? Now, I was nice to you here. I was extremely nice. Am I gonna be giving you equations? No. The reason I'm giving you this equation is because I want you to focus on the stoichiometry and not on the equation, okay? But just be advised from here on out, I'm not giving you equations because you can, you can write this. What kind of reaction is this? What type? Two reactants, one product, what type would that be? Synthesis, right, synthesis. Okay, so let's break down the problem. We've got 16.8 grams of this. Excess just means surplus. You've got a large quantity of H2, but you've only got 16.8 grams of N2. So that's what excess means. It just means you've got surplus. All right? Just like if I'm baking cookies, I've got a five pounds of sugar, but I've only got 12 eggs. All right? Number of eggs that I have is going to limit how many cookies I can make. Even if I've got 20 pounds of sugar, I've only got five eggs or 12 eggs or however many I said. Right? That's going to limit how much I can make. Excess just means you've got tons and tons and tons of it, but I've only got 16.8 grams of N2. Okay, so we're going to go through this step by step by step. Everybody ready to go through this? Here we go. Let's get our stoichiometry on. First of all, we need to ask, is this balance? 
this equation balanced? Two nitrogens, two nitrogens. Six hydrogens, six hydrogens. Yes, this is balanced. Okay, remember, I'm not gonna be giving you equations from here on out. You need to write your own and balance your own, but I gave it to you here because I want you to focus on the stoichiometry non-equation. So here's what I always recommend you do. List the information you're given underneath it and put a question mark with units under the substance you're trying to find information about. Excuse me. That keeps you from plugging in the wrong information about the wrong thing, okay? The problem told me that we've got excess H2. So that means uh, we've got a very large quantity of H2. So H2 isn't gonna play a role in my calculations at all. It's not gonna play any part in my calculations. All I'm dealing with is, okay, I've got 16.8 grams here, and I wanna know how many grams of ammonia I can make. Make sense? So look at your handout. Convert grams of starting materials to moles, unless it's already given. Well, I gave it to you in grams, so we gotta do step one, right? So what do I use to convert grams to moles? Avogadro's number or molar mass? We're gonna have to use the molar mass, All right? So what would the molar mass of N2 be? Each nitrogen has a mass of what? If you don't have a periodic table handy, you might want to take a second and find one. Each nitrogen is what? 14, and there are two, so it would be 28, right? Because it's like 14.007, so we can just run that 14. So we convert grams to moles. Now we're going to carry out extra decimal places and round at the very end. 16.8 divided by 28. But when you punch that into your calculator, but you get 0.6. That is not a number that has anything to round. Right? If you punch that into your calculator, 16.8 divided by 28, the answer is 0.6. Okay? Normally, you would carry out extra decimal places here because we're going to round at the very, very end. Unless there's just a number that you can't round. Right? 0.6, there's nothing to round. It's just 0.6. Okay? But I always make a point of saying that because Normally, you get a number that's got like 15 decimal places. So just carry out, you know, three or four and round at the very end. But here, when you do this division, you get 0.6. There's no rounding to do, okay? So I don't want you to think that I was rounding my answer here. I wasn't. Makes sense? Makes sense? So step one, everybody good on step one? This is what we did last week. And we actually started it the week before. All right, so that's just the molar mass from the periodic table. All right, now here's step two. We're gonna take this number and we're gonna use it to do step two. So this is a sequential process. You take the answer from step one and it's the starting number for step two. You take this answer from step two and that's the starting number for step three. Okay, it's a sequence. So now we're gonna take that answer that we just got and we're gonna multiply by the mole ratio to give you moles of finishing material. What on earth does that mean? Well, I'm trying to get from N2 to NH3, right? Because we don't care about H2, we're ignoring it, we don't care at all. So I'm converting from N2 to NH3. So I need to set up a conversion factor so that N2 goes away and NH3 is what I get. So N2 be on the bottom or on the top in this conversion factor? Bottom, right? Because we want it to go away and we're gonna have NH3 on top. Now those mole ratios, where do those mole ratios come from? Think back to that picture I showed at the beginning of class. The mole ratios come from what? The coefficients, right? So if I'm trying to get moles of N2 to go bye-bye, and I want moles of NH3, well, look at this. The coefficient here is the number that goes here. The coefficient here is the number that goes here. We're completely ignoring H2. It's not factoring into my calculations at all. Again, normally you carry out extra decimal places, but 0.6 times two is 1.2. There's no rounding necessary. Normally you would carry out extra digits because you're gonna round at the very, very end. Look at this and make sure it makes sense. Excuse me.
Does everybody understand step two? This is the most difficult step for most people. All right, knowing which coefficient to use. Why do I pick one and two? Because I'm trying to get from N2, turn it into NH3, right? Coefficient of N2 is one, coefficient of NH3 is two. Point 0.6 times two divided by one is 1.2. Normally, you'd carry out more decimal places, but when you do 0 0.6 times 2, that's what you get. Okay, so is everybody good on step two? Now look at step three on your handout. Convert moles of finishing material back to grams. So what am I going to need in order to convert moles to grams? Avogadro's number or molar mass? Molar mass. Okay, problem didn't ask for it to be in atoms. Problem asked for it to be in grams. Now I rounded my molar mass here. Okay, I rounded it. 14 plus three times one. I rounded it. Bad, bad job on my part, right? You don't want to round your molar masses, but it's about 17. We round our final answer to three sig figs because we're given three sig figs in the problem initially. Make sense? Those are the three steps, that's it. That's it, that's all you have to do. If you can follow those three steps, you're good to go. All this, right? Stoichiometry has this bad, horrible reputation. But again, if you understand the individual steps, it's not bad. If you can't balance an equation, and you can't write a formula, and you can't calculate molar mass, well then yes, you're probably gonna hate stoichiometry. But if you can do all those prerequisite skills, then this is just putting it all together. Okay, so let's just list the steps only. If we begin with one gram of glucose, how many grams of water should we make? What's the first thing we're gonna do? We're gonna convert that one gram to moles, right? using its molar mass. Then what's the step two going to be? What's the mole ratio? One, two, what? Six. Right. And then we're going to convert moles to grams. Make sense? Make sense? Make sense? Okay, so this figure comes from your textbook. You do this one. Reaction, reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas produces water. Um, what mass of water is produced? If 14.2 grams of oxygen gas react with excess H2, according to this equation, I'll pause the recording and give you a chance to work on this. All right, so first thing we have to do, write a balanced equation, which I gave you. How nice of me. Say I never give you anything. There you go. All right. Is it balanced? Four hydrogens, four hydrogens, two oxygens, two oxygens. Yes, that's balanced. Okay. Double check to make sure your equation is balanced, right? Because maybe I give you one and maybe I don't balance it. Maybe I give you one and I balance it wrong. I'm a mean person, right? I could do that. So this time we're finding out information about O2. We're ignoring H2. We have X14.2 <coughs> grams of the O2. And I want to know how much water I can make. All right. <clears throat> Am I going to have to convert this grams to moles? Yes, I didn't give it to you in moles, right? So is the molar mass of O2 16 or 32? 32, I have some tissues if you need tissue. Okay, that's the molar mass, right? Now here are carry out extra decimal places, okay? Carry out extra digits. You're gonna round at the end. You could have carried that out even further. When you do 14.2 divided by 32, you get 0.44375. So if you carried it out even further, that's fine. Because sig figs here don't matter, right? You're going to round to total sig figs at the end. You're going to round your final answer to three sig figs. So if you carried it out to 0 0.44375, that's fine, okay? Just make sure you're carrying out extra. At least three. Questions on step one? Did you get step one right? Woohoo! Okay, now we're going to do the mole ratio, All right? What's the mole ratio here? Two to two, two to one, one to two, what is it? How many moles of O2 do I use? 
One, how many moles of H2O do I make? Two. This is the step that I see students do upside down a lot. Okay, you've got O2 on the bottom because you're trying to get rid of it. You've got H2O on the top because that's what you're converting to. Does that make sense? So again, carrying out extra digits because you're gonna be rounding based on sig figs at the end. Any questions on step two? Any questions on step two? All right, now we're gonna convert moles to grams. So that means we need the molar mass of water, right? I rounded mine to 18, because I'm bad. But even if you carry it all out, your final answer should be pretty darn close to the same as mine. If yours came out to be 16.0, it's probably by rounding. Just depends on how many decimal places you carried at step one and step two. So long as your answer varies from mine by like the last digit, you're fine. If it varies greater than that, something's wrong with your math. Okay. Did you get this one correct? If you made a mistake, you see where you made it. <coughs> Okay, now I'm showing you this for in the future at some point. Okay, when you feel really good at doing this as three individual steps, when you get to the point where you're like, I got this down, I can do step one in my sleep, I can do step two in my sleep, I can do step three, I'm tired of writing all this stuff out. When you are really good at this three steps individually, you can write it as one big long calculation. But do not do it this way until you're ready. Okay, if you never get to this point, that's okay. If you always want to write it as three steps, great, do it that way. But if you get to the point where you're like, you know what, I can do it all at once, then that's fine. This is step one, right, grams to moles. This is step two, mole ratio. This is step three, moles back to grams. So what you do is you multiply all the way across and divide out. Okay, so again, please, 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 don't do it this way until you're really good as step one by itself, step two by itself, and step three by itself, okay? Because if you try to smash this all together too soon, it's gonna be a train wreck, okay? And this is also a reason why students don't like stoichiometry, because they try to jump to this when they're not ready yet, okay? So please do it as three individual calculations until you're ready to do it as one big step. Okay, here's one for you to do. What mass of chlorine gas is required to react with 9.2 grams of sodium. Pause the recording here. All right, let's go over this one. This is unbalanced, All right? So what mass of chlorine gas do I need in order to completely react with 9.2 grams of sodium? Here's an example where you're finding out information about a reactant, right? If I want to completely consume all of this sodium, how much of this chlorine gas do I need to add? Right? That's what this question is asking me. We're not interested at all about the mass of the product. That's why I say that you can use stoichiometry to find out information about reactants or products. Okay. So first we need to balance the equation. Right? The coefficients of two in front of sodium and sodium chloride. I warned you that the problem was unbalanced. Right? I warned you it was unbalanced. So you need coefficient of two in front of Na, coefficient of two in front of NaCl. Problem says I'm given 9.20 grams here. I want to know how much of this I need to add in order to consume all of this. Does this make sense? All right, so we're finding out information about a reactant. We are completely uninterested in the mass of this product. We just don't care. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert grams to moles. Do we agree with this step? Questions on this step? Now let's see, when you divide that out, 9.2 divided by 22.99, it's 0 0.40017. So if you rounded yours to 0 0.4, that's fine. If you carried it out to 0 0.4002, 0 
that's fine too, right? But that, there's not a whole lot of rounding to deal with in this problem, right? Because 0 0.4002, that 0 0.002 isn't gonna make a huge difference in terms of sig figs at the very end, right? So if you've got a whole bunch of zeros, it's probably safe to drop them. <laughs> Okay, does everybody understand how we did step one? Now we're going to multiply by the mole ratio, which is one mole of chlorine used for every two moles of sodium that react. So we're dividing by two, right? 0.4 times one divided by two is 0.2. Again, if you carried it out to 2.0005 or whatever it ends up being, right? That's fine. Do we agree on step two, mole ratio step? This is the step that gets the most people in trouble. I either see it upside down or the wrong mole ratios are used because you didn't balance your equation correctly. Right? If you didn't balance your equation correctly, then obviously this step's gonna be kind of a train wreck. All right, now we're converting it back to grams. Each chlorine is 35.45, therefore Cl2, would be 70.9, all right? If chlorine on its own is 35.45, then Cl2 would be 70.9. Now we're gonna round our final answer based on sig figs. I was given three sig figs here, so I keep three sig figs here. So that means that if I want to completely use up all of this, I need to add 14.2 grams of this. Does this make sense? And this would guarantee that all that sodium would be used up and I wouldn't have any left over. Just like if you are, you know, you've got heartburn, you want to take exactly the amount of Tums to neutralize the acid that you don't want giving you heartburn, right? You don't want any left over. They can't calculate it with stoichiometry, but I guess if you could get a sample, you could. Of course, you have to throw up to get the sample when you're trying to avoid throwing up when you take times, but you know, you know, you get what I'm saying, right? So again, stoichiometry tells us how much we can make, right? But it also tells us how much we should use. All right, try one more, and then we're going to do some limiting reagent problems. Potassium carbonate reacts with barium chloride. I didn't tell you anything beyond that. How many grams of barium carbonate are produced by 1.89 grams of potassium carbonate? This is what your problems will look like in tests and quizzes. Right? No equation, no formulas. It's all up to you to figure those things out. I'll pause the video and let you uh, chew on that one for a few minutes. All right, so here we have a more true to life problem. I didn't give you formulas. I didn't give you an equation, right? What kind of reaction is this? What is it? Double displacement, right? On the, um, the lab you did when you identified types of reactions, a lot of you lost points because you write just double instead of double displacement, right? I think I only took off half a point for that. So first thing we need to do is we need to balance the equation. We need to know formulas to do that though. Right, those are our reactants, there are our products, there's our balanced equation. Do we agree? What information are we given? The mass of K2CO3. We don't care about anything else other than the mass of barium carbonate. Everybody with me here? All right, we're converting grams to moles. Molar mass I got is 138.211. If you rounded yours slightly differently, that's okay. Carrying out extra decimal places, I got 0 0.01367 moles. Do we agree on step one? Or something very, very close, right? If you got 0 0.0137, that's fine. But you need to carry at least three sig figs in step one because you're gonna have three sig figs in your final answer, right? So if you, can re um, if you round your first answer to one sig fig, that's gonna be too much rounding. Right, so you need to keep at least three significant figures. Now I'm multiplying by the mole ratio, which is one to one. The number doesn't change, but the units do. Okay, so even though the number isn't changing, I still want to see this step because I want to know how you converted those units. Okay, 
So a lot of students are like, oh, the number isn't changing, it's one to one. I still wanna know that you know how to convert those units. Okay, because remember the point of a test is to tell me that you know what you're doing. Best way to tell me that you know what you're doing is to show every step. Okay, so show me all those steps. Number doesn't change, just units, right? Because the mole ratio is one to one. Now we're converting moles back to grams. I came up with 197.341. So rounding my final answer to three sig figs gives me 2.70 grams. You need a number, you need units. Do we agree? Do we agree? Do we agree? Do we agree? Okay. Feeling good about this? Just a little light in the mood. What's Kim's favorite tree? A stoichiometry. tree. Okay, now let's talk about limiting reagent. This is the last new thing we're doing today. We'll be doing enrichment on Wednesday. So stoichiometry 2.0, that's all this is. Okay, you're gonna do stoichiometry. In this scenario, if you're given information about more than one substance. So this is exactly the same excuse me, as regular stoichiometry, except now you've just got to do the calculations twice. Instead of three steps, there'll be six. But the difficulty level is exactly the same. So if you understood stoichiometry, this is a cakewalk because you're doing stoichiometry again. You're just going to do it times two. Okay, so let's do an example. I'm making cookies because everybody gets an A on the test. You guys get cookies as your award. Yay. All right, so I can make cookies until I run out of ingredients, or at least one of them. Okay. So if I'm looking at my ingredients here, it doesn't look like I've got a whole lot of sugar. I'm out of sugar, I'm probably done making cookies unless I just want to be cruel and give you cookies without any sugar in them. All right, that would be disgusting. So once I'm out of one ingredient, I can't make any more cookies. And it's kind of a standard example. You can use this for any recipe in your kitchen. Right? Everybody likes cookies. Most people like cookies, I should say. So this, the, the ingredient that I run out of first is called the limiting reagent. Reagent just means reactant. Okay? It's another word for reactant. Okay, so the ingredient that I ran out of first here is sugar. Right? So it limits the amount of sugar I can make. It doesn't matter if I've got 15 dozen eggs and 9 gallons of milk and 20 pounds of flour and eight pounds of butter, right? And 16 bags of chocolate chips if I've only got half a cup of sugar. Right? It doesn't matter how much I have all the other ingredients. If I run out of one, I'm stuck, right? Unless I go to the grocery store. And the same thing works in real life, okay? In this reaction, here's the before and the after. Notice I've got red ones left over, but I don't have any of the gray ones left over. So that means that I ran out of the gray one first, right? So the gray one here is H2 because I'm making water, right? So the one that I ran out of first was the H2. That's my limiting reagent, right? It limits the amount of product I can make. Okay, now the excess reagent is called the reactant that is not limiting. So when we used the word excess a few minutes ago, that's what it means, right? You've got extra. So in this problem, I had O2 left over. That makes it the excess reagent. So the one that you don't run out of first, the one you've got leftovers of, is called the excess reagent. The one that you run out of first is called the limiting reagent. So in my cookies example, the flour and the butter and the sugar, I mean the flour and the butter and the milk and the chocolate chips, right? Those are all excess reagents. Limiting reagent was sugar. Make sense? Make sense, make sense. So take a crack at this one. Here's the before picture. It's hydrogen gas and oxygen gas making H2O. Figure out what the limiting reagent is based on this information and which one's excess, and then draw what the after picture should look like. I'll pause it for a second to let you think about it. See what this will look like. The only way you can draw the after picture is by counting up the proportion you have at the initially, right? Because the formula for water is H2O. So H2O, 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 right? H2O, 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 
H2O, H2O. So should have two H2s left over. One, two, three, four, five, six water molecules. Did you get it right? Six waters, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then two H2s left over. All right, so the way you would do a problem like this is completely based on what you're given initially. Are you just going to cross them off? Just crossing them off. If I gave you different proportions to begin with, obviously your after picture would look different. Your after picture is based completely on what your initial picture looks like. All right, just like the number of cookies I make is a function of how much I start with, right? If on another day I was out of flour instead of sugar, obviously the number of cookies would be different. So the limiting reagent calculations are exactly the same. I know this is a lot of writing. Boil it all down. You're going to do the stoichiometry problem, the calculation twice. And then you're going to pick the smaller number. All this says. All this says. So let's just do an example. 2.59 grams of iron metal reacts with 3.3 grams of oxygen gas and produces iron 3 oxide, which is rust. I want to know what's the theoretical yield. Theoretical yield means how much do I predict I can make. And I want to know which reactant is the limiting reactant. What kind of reaction is this? There are two answers I would accept. Well, actually three. Iron metal, O2, producing iron 3 oxide. That's one acceptable answer for type. Two reactants, one product. Synthesis would work. O2 is a reactant. Combustion, right, if you did it quickly. If it just rusts on your car, that's not combustion, that's a slow process. The third one that I would accept is redox. We haven't done redox yet. We will do it towards the end of the semester. Okay. First of all, we need a balanced equation. So there's my balanced equation. Four iron, three O2. 2Fe2O3. Two two this is just listing out all the elements that are diatomic, right? Fluor, fluorine, iodine, chlorine, bromine, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, right? Those are all the ones that are diatomic. I'm just listing them out there. So this is synthesis slash combustion, if you do it quickly, slash redox. I'd accept any of those. Now we've got information about two substances. So means going to do the stoichiometry twice. Notice the sig figs are different, right? Sig figs are different. This one's got three. This one's got two. So we're going to do the stoichiometry twice. We're going to do the stoichiometry going from iron to rust. We're going to do stoichiometry going from oxygen to rust. And then we're going to compare. And then the smaller number is the answer we choose as our theoretical yield. We pick the smallest number. The smallest number. All right, so let's do it. There's the stoichiometry for iron. Now, I did it as one big calculation to save space on my slide. If you don't like doing it as one big calculation, please do it as three, okay? So if you're doing it as three, you convert grams to moles, you take that number. You multiply by the mole ratio, which is four to two. Take that number, you convert moles to grams, right? That's just the molar mass of this. Okay, so that's what it would look like if you did it all as one calculation. Please, 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 don't attempt to do it this way until you are ready, okay? Just like you don't jump on a bicycle if you can't pedal a tricycle, right? My kids are still working on the tricycle. I'm not going to hand them a bicycle for another couple of years, right? This is what it looks like as one big calculation. Don't do this until you're ready. If you do it as three calculations, that's fine. Step one, step two, step three. 
Step two, step three. Multiplying straight across and dividing up gets 3.70 grams. But am I done? No, I've only done half the work, right? I've done the amount that I can get from iron, but I gotta do this all over again for oxygen. And then compare, and then pick the smallest number. Does everybody understand why we're doing this twice? Because we know information about both substances. So now let's do it for the other substance. Again, this is what it looks like if you're doing it as three, as one big calculation smashed together. Please, 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 please don't do it this way until you're ready, right? There's step one, take that number. There's step two, take that number. There's step three. Okay? Don't do it this way until you are fluent at doing it as three separate steps. Grams to moles, mole ratio, moles to grams. This one gives me 11 grams, right? Two sig figs because 3.3 has two sig figs. Make sense? Make sense? Now we compare from my 2.59 grams, I got 3.70 grams. And from my 3.3 grams, I got 11 grams. Thus, iron was the substance I ran out of first, which means the theoretical yield is 3.70 grams. Now watch out for this, okay? A lot of students will say, oh, this number is smaller than this number, therefore this one's the limiting reagent. Now, in this case, the smaller number does happen to be the limiting reagent, but does that always mean that the smaller number is the limiting reagent? No, it's based on the proportions in the molar mass and the, the stoichiometry is based on the mole ratios, and it's based on the molar masses, right? Just like in my cookie recipe, right, you only need like a teaspoon of salt or half a teaspoon or something like that, right? So Right, salt's probably not going to be the limiting reagent, but you only need a tiny bit. So don't don't base, you know, the smaller number must be the limiting reagent because that's not true. That's not true at all. Right, limiting reagent is based on stoichiometry, not based on initial number. And the amount that stoichiometry predicts that I will make is called theoretical yield. Now, when you go into the lab and do it, is it going to guarantee that you'll get 3.70 grams? No, that's not a guarantee, right? The value that you get when you do this experiment is based on how good you are as a chemist, right? Stoichiometry says, hey, this is how much we predict you're gonna make. When you go in the lab and do it, <clears throat> that's where you put the pedal to the metal and actually try it out. <clears throat> Makes sense, Makes sense? All right, now here's something that I wanna do. I actually wanna skip over this one. I wanna talk about percent yield real quick. Okay, percent yield, percent yield is a proportion, is, a, is something we calculate to see how well you did in lab. So this week in lab, you're doing a stoichiometry experiment, I'm almost certain. I'll look at the schedule real quick. Yep, you're doing a stoichiometry experiment. So you're going to calculate your percent yield in lab this week. So you'll use stoichiometry to get your theoretical yield, then you're going to go do the experiment, and that gives you your actual yield or your experimental yield, right? So this is how much you think you're gonna make. This is how much you actually end up making. Actual over theoretical times 100 gives you your yield, okay? Now the, the way you gauge percent yield is based on the difficulty of the experiment, right? If the experiment's way difficult, you get a 30% yield, you're like, woohoo! If your experiment's not that difficult, you get a 30% yield, you're gonna get sad face on your paper, right? I'm not making you do a crazy experiment. Your experiment's gonna be pretty straightforward. So your yield should be very good, right? What should your yield be in a perfect world? If everything goes perfectly, what should your yield be? A hundred, right? Because these two numbers would be the same. 90 over 90 would be one, right? One times 100 would be 100. So in a perfect world, your percent yield is 100. Now if it's 96, right? That means your actual yield is too low. So you need to rationalize that and explain, why is your yield too low? If your answer comes out to be 110, well, that's not possible. 
Why is your yield value here too high? I need to be able to explain those kinds of things. So here's what I'm going to do now. Let's see, where is that problem I wanted you to do? There we go. Aluminum chloride is formed when aluminum metal reacts with chlorine gas. Write a balanced equation. If 0.4 grams aluminum reacts with 0.6 grams chlorine gas, what is the theoretical yield of aluminum chloride? And then which reagent is excess? Which reagent is limiting? I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, let's go over the answer. So we've got to do the stoichiometry twice, right? First of all, we need to do a balanced equation. Mole ratios are 2 to 3 to 2. 0.4 grams, 0.6 grams, and I want to know what mass of aluminum chloride I can get. So there's the stoichiometry for the aluminum. Again, please only do it this way when you're ready. Right, there's grams to moles, there's mole ratio, there's moles to grams, get 2.0, two sig figs. Here's the calculation for the Cl2. Grams to moles, mole ratios, two to three. Notice this value you only have to calculate once, right? You only have to calculate this value once. It should be the same both times. If you get different mole molar masses here, something's wrong because this is the same substance. Therefore, it should have the same molar mass both times. This one gives us 0.75, right? So limiting reagent must be Cl2, and the excess reagent is AL. Here is an example where the bigger number is actually the limiting reagent. Okay, so don't just look at those initial numbers and go, oh, that one's smaller, it's limiting reagent, because that's a bad, bad, bad assumption to make, right? Because stoichiometry is what determines this, not initial amounts, okay? So, I'm going to stop the video. If you need to see this more, you can go check out the video online. That's where we're going to stop today.